All right, welcome everyone. My name is Prez, and in this chapter of the DCS F-14 Tomcat for Dummies, we will be understanding how to operate the AUG-9 radar as a Rio in the Tomcat. We will be learning how to both read, understand, and use the AUG-9 radar so you can get started as a Rio. Keep in mind that I will not be discussing radar techniques to get around certain issues like notching or being able to see through ground returns. For that, I will leave it up to its own video, which leads me into my next topic. I'm thinking of making a complementary series to this for more advanced techniques in the Tomcat to help people with understanding how to use the Tomcat effectively more so than just understanding the systems. Such as, uh, you know, effective BVR, uh, dogfighting, and Rio techniques. I'm thinking of calling it Tomcat for Top Guns, or something like that. Uh, I think it has a nice ring to it, but you guys should let me know in the comments if you like the idea as well. Uh, now that all that is out of the way, let's get on with the lesson. First, let's understand how to manipulate the actual radar. The radar control panel is located on the outside portion of your left leg panel. These six knobs and switches are what control the actual radar dish. The first switch on the top left is the ground stabilization switch. This will be on by default, and I would suggest not messing with it because turning it off will disable the gyroscope that keeps it level with the ground, and instead makes it follow the direction of the nose of the aircraft. While there are neat tricks you can do to take advantage of this ability, as a beginner I would highly recommend not messing with it, otherwise your job as a Rio will become a lot harder. However, if you do hit this switch, it's important to know that when you turn it back on, it takes a few seconds for the gyros to realign, and while it does that, you will be unable to manipulate the radar. Directly beneath that switch is the VSL switch. This is just a Rio accessible ACM mode switch for the VSL low and high modes. It's not necessary that you manipulate this switch because when you are in a merge, you should really just be handing over the radar control to the pilot and focus on being a pocket AWACS. Next are the azimuth and elevation knobs. These will allow you to point the radar left or right and up or down respectively. The maximum radar azimuth for the AUG-9 is plus or minus 65 degrees from center, and the maximum radar elevation is plus 60 degrees or a whopping minus 80 degrees, making it so the Tomcat can nearly look directly underneath itself to spot targets. Next are the azimuth angle selection knob and the elevation bar selection knob. In the Tomcat, you have a choice of four different azimuth scan sizes. These are plus or minus 10 degrees, plus or minus 20 degrees, plus or minus 40 degrees, or plus or minus 65 degrees. The elevation bar sizes available in the Tomcat are a 1, 2, 4, and impressive 8 bar search. Keep in mind that while it may be tempting to use the largest scan possible, it takes time to complete these scans, and using the largest scan, a 65 degree 8 bar search, it can take up to 14 seconds for the radar to finish its scan. Now, below all the radar controls are the TCS controls. The TCS is the camera in the front and underside of the Tomcat's nose. This allows you to visually identify targets from a pretty significant range and even spot missiles coming off them in combat situations. There's really only one switch here you should be concerned with, and that is the center one, the FOV switch. By default, this is set to a wide view. You can tell whether or not you are in a narrow or wide view on the actual TCS screen by whether or not you can see these two vertical lines on the side. The two lines being there indicate a wide field of view and narrow when they are gone. If you've used the targeting pod in the A-10, F-18, F-16, etc., you'll be familiar with this sort of symbology. Alright, now it's finally time to look at the DDD or Detailed Data Display and the rest of the radar controls. Now there are a lot of knobs, buttons, and switches that currently have absolutely zero function in the Tomcat, so if I don't cover it, there is no function to that button or it is not necessary to know and mess with as a beginner Rio. You'll learn all the tricks of the trade in later videos. So let's get started. First off, let's cover the actual DDD screen you will be looking at. This white vertical line on the screen is the current location along the azimuth the radar is scanning relative to the nose of the aircraft, and it moves across the screen back and forth. Next you will notice these two dots right here. These are radar returns. Any and all radar returns will be displayed as these little dark blips on the screen. You'll also notice this scale down here, with a 0 and a 30 on either side. This is the azimuth scale in degrees relative to the nose of the aircraft. There is also a center cross here, which essentially divides the top, bottom, left, and right of the DDD. Now let's get more specific based on radar modes. In pulse Doppler mode, the DDD will be displayed as an azimuth versus closure scale. 
The top half of the DDD will display returns as having positive closure, and the bottom half will display returns as having negative closure. The closure scale by default is 2400 knots across, and again, by default, stretches from zero to positive or negative 1200 knots. Also, to help out with judging the speed of a radar return, look over here at these three lines. The large center one is representative of zero knots of relative speed. This lines up with the center cross over here, and just so happens to also be the center of the zero Doppler filter. These other two lines represent half of the maximum relative speed for the scale you are using. So in most cases, this will be 600 knots. Let's quickly look at how the AUG9 determines closure rate. Think of the vector of a target as a right triangle viewed from a, a top-down perspective. The hypotenuse, or the longest side, is the target vector. The other two sides would be the target's movement along your azimuth and the movement towards or away from you. The only movement the radar cares about is this movement towards or away from you. So, in this example, let's say the aircraft is flying in some direction at 500 knots. That means the relative motion of that aircraft to your aircraft is the vector of movement towards or away from you, which could be anywhere from 0 to 500 knots depending on the angle of the aircraft. Thankfully, the AUG9's computer does all this for you, but it's important to know because radar contacts will not be displayed with their absolute speed on the DDD. Now, let's look much closer at our example here. Here we see two radar contacts, one with positive closure and one with negative closure. If we look at the positive closure target, we can see that it is slightly off-center to the right of the aircraft's nose and flying at just under 600 knots towards us. And if we look at the negative closure rate target, we can see that it is almost exactly 10 degrees off the left-hand side from the nose of the aircraft and traveling at over 600 knots away from us. One last thing to note, it's important to understand that the AUG-9 radar did not have the technology to understand and determine target aspect like newer, proper, fourth generation aircraft such as the F-15. All you can really tell is whether or not the target is closing or escaping you and their relative ground speed to your aircraft. We'll talk more about how the Tomcat determines target vectors later. I know this sort of stuff seems pretty confusing, but with practice, this will all become second nature to you. Now, what if we were in pulse mode? Well, in this case, the DDD will change to an azimuth versus range scale, which will be a top-down view of the space in front of your aircraft. And now the symbology to be aware of changes. The only symbology to worry about in this mode are these two range ladders. They divide your current range scale into fifths based on these tick marks. In this example, the range scale is set to 200 nautical miles, as seen here, so each of these tick marks in the ladder is equal to some multiple of 40 nautical miles. And as we can see in the example, we have one radar contact roughly 20 nautical miles from the aircraft and about 10 degrees off the left side of the aircraft, and another contact roughly 60 nautical miles directly ahead of our aircraft. It's important to know that in pulse mode you will see ground returns if the radar is pointed at the ground and it can be hard to spot aircraft while in this mode. As a Rio, you should learn which mode to use at what time and for which situations. Each mode has its strengths and weaknesses, but again, with enough practice you'll become a seasoned Rio in no time. Now, let's cover all these other functions top down, left to right. First up is the radar elevation bar. This bar shows you both the antenna elevation angle as represented by this white arrow on the right, and it also shows you which bar the radar is currently scanning as represented by this left arrow that constantly moves up and down as the radar scans. As you can see, the AUG-9 radar is able to point the radar to see up to 60 degrees above the nose of the aircraft and a whopping 80 degrees below the aircraft, meaning you can practically look directly underneath your aircraft in certain situations. Next, let's cover this center section. These six buttons labeled 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, and 200 relate to the range scale options available when using pulse mode and the current range set will be displayed here when in pulse mode. Next, these four green lights will tell you certain things relating to tracking. These two on the left when lit up will tell you that the radar is properly tracking a target. This one labeled JAT tells you that you are currently tracking a target using a jammer. And the last one tells you that the TCS is also tracking that same target. The reason it is labeled IROT instead of TCS is because the earliest versions of the Tomcat had an infrared search and track feature, however the technology was faulty and eventually replaced by the TCS camera. Next are these two knobs right here. The left one labeled Pulse Video changes the visibility of radar returns on the DDD when using pulse mode. 
and the right knob labeled bright adjusts the brightness of the actual display. These next two switches are important for pulse Doppler mode and why I specified the closure scales are defaulted to positive or negative 1200 knots. All you need to know about the switch on the right is that when flipped up, it increases the closure scale to 4800 knots rather than 2400 knots. So unless you're intercepting SR-71 Blackbirds in low Earth orbit, I suggest not messing with this one. Now on the left, we have an aspect switch. This is by default set to the beam option, which is essentially your standard all-around option for viewing radar contacts in pulse Doppler mode. This is the default plus or minus 1200 knots. Now if we move the switch down to the tail position, it pushes the scale down to favor looking at a wider range of negative closure targets. This changes the scale from plus or minus 1200 knots to only positive 600 knots and negative 1800 knots. Now what if we push this switch up to the nose option? It does the exact same thing, however, it favors higher positive closure rate targets and will now display targets from negative 600 knots to positive 1800 knots. On the DDD. This is also why I stated these smaller lines on the side were half the maximum scale and not a set number. Now these final two knobs are quite simple. This left one labeled pulse gain is essentially a filter knob that allows you to filter out certain strengths of radar returns when using pulse mode to aid in seeing targets against the ground or simply filtering out weak returns. This one on the right labeled erase changes how quickly the radar returns fade from the DDD. Rotating it to the left decreases the erase speed, and rotating it to the right increases the erase speed. Now, let's talk about this section right here. The first most important button to know is this one. This is the IFF, or Interrogate Friend or Foe button. Radar returns will not be automatically displayed as friend or foe in the Tomcat. You must manually determine whether or not a target is friendly or hostile. Thankfully, this is quite easy. All you need to do is press and hold this button. When doing so, it will display all radar returns and whether they are friend or foe. Friendly returns will be displayed as this large symbol with two very distinct horizontal lines, and hostile returns will be displayed as just the standard rectangle blip. IFF returns will also be displayed on an azimuth versus range scale similar to pulse mode. As you can see in this example, we have one friendly contact at roughly 20 nautical miles and a hostile contact at roughly 60 nautical miles. The next buttons to look at are your WCS modes. These are very clearly labeled and will change how your radar is processing information. They are all clearly labeled, so hopefully there's no confusion, and hopefully you watch the previous chapter to understand what all these modes actually do. The PD search and pulse search will put you in either pulse Doppler or pulse search modes depending on the one you press. These search modes do not display any information on the TID screen, only the DDD. Hitting RWS will set your radar into range while search mode. This will display radar contact information on your TID. And finally, TWS manual and TWS auto. TWS manual will put you into TWS mode, and you will need to manually control the radar antenna and point it at the targets out in front of you. TWS auto, however, will automatically attempt to hold track on any radar returns you pick up. The AUG-9 will automatically switch into this mode upon firing an AIM-54 Phoenix missile in TWS mode. So it is important to learn how to sanitize the airspace before firing. We will talk about how to do this in the air-to-air -air combat tutorial for the Rio. Now let's move on to the TID. You should already know the air-to-air -air symbology, so I won't be discussing that in this tutorial. One thing we will discuss about the TID symbology, however, is how the vector lines on the TID are determined. If you remember from earlier, I said the AUG-9 did not have the necessary technology to determine target aspect like newer aircraft could, so the vectors displayed on the TID are not the target's actual direction of travel. The vector displayed is a relative direction of motion based on another math concept using triangles. And I know, I know, more math and triangles. I know we're all sick of it, but these are important concepts to understand if you wish to become a skilled Rio. Let's take some origin point and draw our vector straight out from this point. Our vector will always be pointing straight out ahead. Then we draw the actual vector for the target. Finally, we will draw a vector starting from the end of our vector to the end of the target's vector. And here is where we get the target's relative vector. This means that even though an aircraft's actual vector may be pointing away from us, if we were flying faster than that aircraft, then the relative vector of that aircraft would still be pointing towards us. 
I know it may be a little confusing, but with practice you'll be able to easily tell what direction aircraft are traveling just by knowing your own aircraft's speed and looking at the vectors on the TID. The first two knobs located here function as labeled, however the contrast knob does nothing unless you are using the TCS screen or the lantern pod. The next two buttons are the memory mode button here on the left and the collision steering button here on the right. The memory mode button is by default off, however pressing it will change the Aug9's memory mode from 14 seconds to 2 minutes. It's important to know that when firing Phoenix missiles, the radar will automatically switch into this 2 minute long memory mode after a missile has been in flight for at least 16 seconds. The collision button is off by default, but enabling it will change the steering cues given to a pure pursuit steering cue, which will point you directly at the target in single target track, or at the mathematical center of all your radar tracks in TWS. You won't really be using this button all that much, but it's good to know. Now let's move on to the bottom of the TID. These eight buttons will change the way symbology is displayed on the TID for both you and the pilot. Both the RID disable and the jammer strobe buttons serve no function currently in the Tomcat. The altitude number button is on by default, but hitting this will get rid of all altitude symbology on the TID. Symbol elements will erase all symbology except for a tiny dot to display radar targets. Data link will disable all data link symbology. Disabling this can help when having troubles hooking a target on your TID. Non-attack will erase all non-hostile symbols from the TID. So it's important you finish IFFing targets on your TID before hitting this button. Launch zone will enlarge the target vectors and display launch range symbology. This isn't very helpful in most situations. However, it's there if you need to extend the vector symbols of your radar targets. The last button is the Velocity Vector button, which will erase velocity vectors from the TID. Next are two very important selector knobs. The first on the left will change the TID display modes to Ground Stabilize, Aircraft Stabilize, Attack Mode, and TV Mode. The AC Stabilize and Attack Modes are essentially the exact same, however Attack Mode will display engagement-specific symbology, such as a virtual horizon line, display the current weapon selected at the bottom right on the TID located here, and also display steering cues. Now Ground Stabilize, however, will display a 360 degree view of your aircraft stabilized at the exact position you were at when you switch to this view mode. It does not follow you around and is not oriented to the position of your nose at the time you switch to it. Ground Stabilize mode will always display the top of the TID as being true north, which gives you a very accurate and simple to use top-down view of the battlefield. Learning to use this in combat is an invaluable skill as it provides an unbelievable amount of situation awareness when using data link. Now, TV mode will switch the TID display to display what the TCS sees. The built-in camera is an extremely powerful tool to use in the Tomcat, and I suggest learning to switch to it whenever acquiring a single target track. Don't worry about it replacing the radar screen on the TID. The DDD will display all of the relevant information for you, and in reality is the actual radar screen in the Tomcat. The last selector knob located on the right is your range selector knob. The range scale options available are 25, 50, 100, 200, and 400 nautical miles. Selecting a range using this will change the view range on the TID. This is also an important function to learn to use for both situational awareness and air-to-air -air combat. Now, let's move over to the all-important HCU or hand control unit. The movement of this should be automatically bound to your joysticks X and Y axis. However, there are some other important controls on here you should bind to ensure you are able to actually do things as a Rio. Those controls being half trigger, full trigger, and offset. Half trigger will essentially activate the joystick for whatever function you have selected, and full trigger is essentially a left mouse button click for your HCU. We'll talk about what the offset button is used for in, the, in a moment. Some other controls you may want, but are not necessary, are MRL, thumb up, and thumb down. MRL stands for manual rapid lock-on mode, and is simply a dogfight mode for the Rio to use, which lets you manually take control of the radar and point it around to lock onto contacts out in front of you. However, this is difficult to use, only has a 5 nautical mile range, and even in real life, Rios never actually used it, but it is a function you can use if you want. Thumb up and thumb down controls are this red gear looking dial right here. This is just a fine tuning dial for your radar elevation and may help you with moving the radar elevation around to be more accurate. It has a range of plus or minus four degrees of movement from wherever you've pointed the radar elevation. Now, let's talk about the four buttons located on the left here. Your HCU will by default have the TID cursor option selected. The function this button provides is when pressing and holding half trigger, a little circle will pop up on your TID. 
This is your cursor, and you can move it around freely on the screen using your joystick. Pressing full trigger will lock this cursor in place, or when slewed over a radar contact, will hook that target. You will also notice that pressing full trigger to lock the cursor changes it to a much brighter green. This also changes the radar targets you hook to the same green to let you know that it has been hooked up. Now, when using the half and full trigger buttons to place the cursor somewhere, you can also press the offset button, and what this will do is move the position of your aircraft on the TID to that location. This is extremely helpful when you're trying to get a better view of certain areas on your TID that would otherwise be out of view. Simply pressing the offset button again will reset your TID view to normal, and when in ground stabilize mode, offset will return the center of the TID to your aircraft, which is again, extremely powerful when trying to gather information in these modes. The next button is for the DDD cursor. This one isn't very useful, but what it does is when pressing half trigger, a large cross will appear on the DDD, at which point you can move it around the screen using your HCU and pressing full trigger will lock it into place. Think of it as sort of a simple visual bookmark feature for the DDD if you wanted to keep an eye on something. The next button is the radar button. This one will allow you to take full control of the radar's antenna. When pressing half trigger, you will be able to manually slew the radar around in a sort of super search function. You will also notice a cursor appear on the DDD. It looks like this in pulse Doppler mode and like this in pulse mode. When you press full trigger in this mode, the radar will attempt to acquire a radar lock on whatever you've pointed the cursor at in the respective radar modes. We will talk more about single target tracking in the air-to-air -air combat tutorial. The last button on the HCU is the IR slash TV button. With this button selected, when you have the TID set to TV mode, you will be able to manually slew the TCS around and lock onto objects using the half and full trigger functions of the HCU. It's a function you will probably rarely use, but it's there if you really want to lock someone up visually without spiking them with your radar. Finally. The last bit of information we will discuss is how to IFF targets on the TID. First, you will need to have your cap category set to target data as you can see here. The cap will now display these 10 options, but the only ones you need to know right now are these three right here. Friend, Unknown, and Hostile. Hitting these buttons will change the symbology of a hooked radar contact to that selected symbol. In this example, we have an unknown contact out in front of us. I have hooked him using the TID cursor, and as you can see, we now also have some radar information about the contact, such as his range and relative bearing. Now, let's IFF him. When pressing the IFF button on a hook target, the DDD will display IFF information differently. Instead of seeing all targets IFF'd on your DDD, you will only see the one you have hooked up in the very center under the cross of the DDD. Friendlies are quite a bit easier to see as you can tell. Hostile contacts will be difficult to spot under the cross, however this can also be seen as a quick way to tell that what you're looking at is not friendly since it doesn't have the big friendly symbol displayed. Now that we know what the IFF return is for the hook target, in this case we'll say it's hostile, we can now turn back to our cap and press the hostile button indicated by the green arrow that lights up. And if we look at the TID, we will see that our hooked contact is now displayed as a hostile contact. It's as simple as that. You will want to do this for every radar contact you plan to engage to ensure you aren't shooting any friendlies down by mistake. And with that out of the way, this completes the AUG-9 tutorial for Rios. You should now have a good understanding of how to control the AUG-9, how to read radar information, and how to IFF targets. I know it's a lot of information to take in, but with practice, you'll get these things down and know them like the back of your hand. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments and I'll be happy to help you out there. Also, if you're looking to join a squadron and learn a lot about air-to-air -air combat, then consider joining Alamo Squadron. Not only will you learn a lot of information on how to excel at air-to-air -air combat in DCS, but you can also speak to me directly there as I am a member and the Tom instructor for the squadron. A link to join will be available in the description. Other than that, in the next chapter of this series we will be discussing in depth the actual weapon systems available to the Tomcat for air-to-air -to -air combat and how to employ these weapons in the most effective way possible. So with that out of the way, if you enjoyed the video leave a like, if you want to see more from me please be sure to hit the subscribe button, and feel free to share this with anyone you know that may be new to the Tomcat so they can be sure to learn all they can and soon be a Tomcat ace. So I hope you enjoyed the video, thank you for watching, and have a nice day.